Hi there. Welcome to Cannabis Talk with your host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. Happy 420, everybody. Yes, you heard right. The incorrigible Mr. Zeppo smokes pot. I'm out of the closet. Woo! Ding, 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 ding. Uh, for those wondering who've never heard the music, that is Maple Leaf Ragtime. Maple Leaf Rag from 1899. Z Brewster Guys version by Scott Joplin. Available for your enjoyment at freemusicarchive.org. Thanks for tuning in to this frank and honest look at cannabis from a slightly different perspective than those typically bandied about by the mainstream media. As always, you can submit your questions to any of my show segments to the email the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo at gmail.com. There's a link to it all over my profiles and pages and signatures. Go find it. Today's show is recorded in front of a live Sprecher Studio audience, although there's no one in the chat room. That audience effect is totally an effect, as you already knew. And, uh, is available, this episode and future episodes, always available on YouTube after the fact. If you're just tuning in for the very, very first time, um, this is the introduction episode to a segment I've been anticipating and excited about and anxious about and worried about and overthinking about for a long time. If you don't know who I am or what I'm trying to do on Sprecher and YouTube and Facebook, I humbly invite you to follow me. Uh, I'm all over social media, but I tend to focus on the ones I just mentioned with Twitter sort of being an automatic you know, everything gets kicked out through either Facebook or the other things to it. Um, I'm most responsive, I'm trying to be, I'm going to be most responsive to emails at that Gmail account, which is currently comically empty, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven emails. Two of them are, three of them are for Google. It's just about my password and stuff. Uh, one of them is from Facebook, which is verifying that I you created this email or that I'm using email, blah, blah, blah. And the other two are either sales pitches or scams. It's not the sad condition, folks. Uh, I'm here because I feel a calling to be of service, and, uh, and by that I mean to be mildly entertaining and informative. And, uh, and uh, while it may seem a bit showboaty, I think that I can be of service by cultivating uh, an audience and, you know, answering questions to the best of my ability. And, and right now, today, for the first time in a long time, uh, we're going to talk about cannabis. I've mentioned it occasionally before in past episodes of other segments. But this segment's going to be all inclusive, all specifically about that. First things first. I'm a person who respects our society and its laws and its procedures. And I'm very proud that California, my home state, uh, passed Prop 64 uh, in the wake of Colorado and other states. Uh, decriminalizing in one form or another this beautiful plant that can grow out of the ground or out of a five-gallon bucket uh, in your apartment. More on that later. Um, and what, what am I trying to say? Before, in California, in, in my life, um, I have experienced, you know, the consuming of pot before. I'm not, it's not like, I'm not going to pretend. The way... Uh, celebrities or personalities, especially political figures in our past, 
have had to wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Oh yeah, I only tried it once or twice. Pot is common. Pot is subversively counterculturally popular. It's not an accident. Uh, there's many uh, philosophical statements that have been made by very smart men about cannabis. Um, and the first thing to do, to I want to make clear as an enthusiast, as an advocate, and as a public speaker about cannabis is that like anything else in the world, it's your intent and the, the way in which you choose to, to engage with it. And the very first myth, misleading, dare I even say lie, that I want to disavow about it is that it is just like alcohol. No. Now, uh, there's a lot to unpack and to discuss. But let's zoom back in on Prop 64. Huzzah, Prop 64. Please note, for all of you who are already members of the tribe and enthusiastic, please be informed and be well aware of the fact that the laws that we voted for have not been finalized, have not been fully drafted out yet, and there's still many stipulations to come. There's a lot of variance involved in them, and do not take effect until next January. If you weren't aware of that, and you're listening to this, and it's 4.20 or 5 o'clock, and you're kind of stoned, let that sink in. The laws that we voted for in California, this does not apply to other states. If you're listening to me out of state, I don't know about your laws, but I will in future episodes. I just have not gone and done that super mega research to be most up to date. Up to, but we're going to be about that. And there's obviously more professional shows about that there, but I, I'm trying to bring my personal perspective, and I'm not seeing... My worldview about cannabis being expressed in the current cannabis culture media, which is not too terrible of a critique of cannabis culture media. I, I'm glad that now you know there are media projects coming out of the cannabis closet. Uh, respect, safety, moderation, and knowing yourself and your intent with it are always key and important. It is not just al like alcohol. Uh, it's very important to keep in mind. And if you're if you're in California. Perhaps 64 doesn't kick in until next year, and you really should read up on it then. Because it will vary county to county, and maybe even city by city, which is something, if you pay enough attention to what's going on with your, um, if you uh, are paying attention to your local dispensaries, and you're the doctor with whom you, you renew your uh, medical reg is in a creepy, um, corrupt doctor. Sorry, guys, I know you're out there, and if you happen to be listening, please, forgive me, I'm not trying to call you out, but um, we all have our faults, no one's perfect, but there are people who are abusing the system, and it's not cool. Um, yeah, so, cannabis. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to lay it out right up front, the most radical thing I have to say about cannabis. And I would love to hear people's response. I would just love to open the show every day. Cannabis, and say the following statement and have the guest respond and have a conversation about it. Let me tell you, there's a lot of opinions about cannabis out there in the world. And mine is a little bit out there. Uh, I've heard other people express this before. And the first time I heard the following sentence stated, I was really dubious. But I had a very different, I was at a different place, a different time in my life different set of experiences and a different relationship and awareness of what is and what is not the truth about cannabis. Let me make it clear. Uh, one of the reasons I have not put out a show, an episode of this segment, uh, and even though I've had it up, anybody who is a hardcore listener and has been to my Sprecher website, uh, it's seen that the Cannabis Talks picture has been up, but it's been zero episodes. I do not endorse, I don't do, I hope never to accidentally portray the smoking of cannabis in conjunction with getting right into your car and driving somewhere. It should not be done that way. Uh, I strongly discourage it. I know lots of people, old timers, who've been smoking for a long time, probably really super chill and comfortable and feel that they drive okay with it, but I strongly discourage it. I, and it has a lot, to, as much to do with the fact that um, while yes, I can concede that smoking a little bit of weed is and getting into a car and going somewhere, especially for someone with a long history of smoking weed, is much safer than drinking 
a couple of beers or a couple of stiff shots and getting in a car and driving somewhere. E both of them are equally objectionable under the law. And before we go any further in this show, I want it. I want this to be understood about who I am. I respect the law. I think I said it just at the beginning of the show. I respect the law. I respect the fact that we are a society of laws. I also acknowledge, and 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 I think you know, I'm part of a collective of people that acknowledge that oftentimes laws are unfair and unjust and unworthy of being supported. And as many of a many uh, a good American and a good citizens of the world, and you know, before in the past, and here in other places, have said, when a law is unjust, unfair, in America we might say unconstitutional. It is our civic duty, arguably our moral duty, to not abide by that law and to work towards changing it. And that's what we're trying to achieve. I'm a mid-level, I'm not, or, I don't, I, no. I'm an activist. I'm not as deeply involved as many other people that you might know or you might be if you're listening out of curiosity. Uh, but I would like to be more involved. Uh, but I also respect, you know, the law. So don't smoke it in your car. That's just dumb. All right. Be aware of where and how the restrictions actually apply to you. Prop 64 does not make it legal to go smoke at the school playground around the corner from you, from your apartment complex in the middle of the night. That's not cool. Never was cool, isn't cool. Prop 64 does not make it legal for a 14 year old to light up. Now, that gets into parenting issues at that level, but it also gets into free will issues. And if God bless it, if there are children listening, if there are minors under the age of 18 listening, please know that as a minor, I was of the opinion that we should cling to our innocence and, and, be, and be as informed about our transition into adulthood as possible and wait as long as possible before we begin things. Um, and I respectfully disagreed with, without ho hopefully uh, emotionally badgering or judging anybody that started doing crazy bullshit before they were old enough. Don't drink before you're 21. Don't 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 get a fake ID and go to bars. Don't don't be underage and smoke. Don't be underage and date people who are way overage. Just don't do it. It sounds like a fun idea. It's not. I'll leave it at that. The craziest thing I had to say about that, which is what I really wanted to get into, is that it is a divine, sacred plan. So I just realized I wanted to get all that legal disclaimer in. So I'm completely off from all social work responsibilities and going nowhere for the rest of the day. I'm going to record podcast episodes that it take go to sleep. That is responsible use. Even if it were just recreational. If I were talking about drinking beer, that is the correct way the morally uh, appropriate, safe, reasonable way to drink alcohol, no matter what your opinion is on it. I speak from the position of being a former drinker that was on the slippery slope of alcoholism and struggled with it. Uh, and that's a lifelong overcoming it. Anybody who's ever uh, been forced to listen to an alcohol anonymous um, inductee ramble on and do work their steps. You know that, you know, uh, the alcohol like suffers intolerably. And I, I don't mean to make an association with Alcoholics Anonymous. I do not represent them. Uh, I, I like what they do, and I agree with a lot of their methodology, and I attend them occasionally. Full disclosure. And this part's scary for me, friends and folks, and anybody out there listening who's a perfect stranger. But I believe that I am in complete compliance with the law and that this should not cause me any problems. I'm a person, like I just acknowledged, struggled with alcohol. Because let's, let's be really clear. Here's why I make the distinction between cannabis and alcohol. Let's talk for a minute about alcohol. What is alcohol? Benjamin Franklin said, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to have fun. Benjamin Franklin's an interesting guy. He's also rumored to have participated in several orgies. How un-American is that? How totally awesome American is that? I'm not sure. Um, that was totally random. It meant to be funny. Uh, is that true? I don't know. Here's what I know that is scientifically verifiable. Theorists, real science, nutrition, biologists, zoology theorists, I forget who exactly, but somebody in some sort of natural world study theorists posit 
that the human species is prone towards alcoholism at a deep, dare we almost say evolutionary way, because maybe when we were in a you know much more primitive state, we would in, really enjoy the toxic effects of overripe, slightly rotten fruit, and we figured out how to make a basic sort of like junk, you know, not to sound racist, it's not meant to be racist, but like a fruit cocktail, like a jungle juice of like, mmm, fermented fruit juice. We figured that out probably before we had fire. Okay. Now, if you believe in some other radical uh, timeline of human history, guess what? Everybody's timeline of human history is wrong. Don't want to argue about it. Um, I don't think in a totalitarian way that my uh, timeline of human history is correct. I'm just indicating that we all are going to get schooled whenever we do get explained the actual timeline of human history. I'm sure there's a shit ton of missing chapters. But at one point, evolutionarily speaking, or survivalistically speaking, after some collapse of the, of the golden era when we lost our technologies and to live like cave people again, um, which is something I, I posit to you might have actually happened. We did all that. We built this long-standing association with, with drinking fermented things. But let it be really clear, scientifically, digestively, and you know, biologically, endocrinology, in every way you can measure alcohol and its effects on the body in a measurable, repeatable, verifiable, scientific way, um, it's toxic for you. It's poison. If consumed long enough, hard enough, it will kill you. Alcohol kills you. And we have a multi-billion dollar industry on drinking it, built around selling it to you, to take home, to drink at places and get in your car and drive away. That's not a moral opinion, what I just said. That's, not, that's a scientific fact. The effects that you feel that we condition ourselves through peer pressure and through marketing and through, it is sort of mildly pleasant. Um, we convince ourselves into believing that Alcohol is fun and helps me cope with life, helps me relax, helps me unwind, all the typical things you hear about that, you tell, that we tell ourselves. But the phenomenological thing happening, the actual biochemistry, is our body at a cellular level going, oh, fuck, blah, fuck. that shit's bad for us. And the, some cells in our stomach and some cells in over here, some cells over there are dying. And some cells in our brain are a little bit more taxed out, going to die sooner than rather than later die. Now, I have tried on every kind of philosophical hat in the world, and like an ethical hedonist would say, so what? Same is true about cigarettes. Same is true about driving a car. Whoa, 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 whoa! The standard normal sheeply person would be like, how is driving a car slowly killing you? Think about it. No matter how fancy your car is, no matter how hardcore your air conditioning is. You are sucking down the hundreds of thousands and millions of other cars pumping out tons of toxic fumes right in front of you and all around you, behind you, every day, even if your windows are up. Don't freak out. Keep breathing. But that's a true thing. All right? So there are things that are toxic and there are things that are not toxic. And that's always that's true in nature and that's true in the things that we make for ourselves um, and we just have to be really real about it. I'm not a, a hardcore abolitionist. Um, I believe in free will. Even more, I, I, I subscribe to the, I support, I, I am, um, uh, I'm firmly rooted that it is an organic experience, an organic phenomena, so therefore an undeniable, that's what unalienable means. When we talk about unalienable rights, hard word for me to pronounce, English is my second language, Third, if you consider the fact that I come from another dimension. Um, so free will, right, means you can do whatever you want. Now, people sometimes choose to do horrible, horrible things. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. Um, I'm not, and I, I support free will. I also believe, you know, I'm like a chaotic, if this were a D&D &D game, I'm chaotic, neutral, or to the rest of the spectrum that's good. Right? I don't go any further in evil. Uh, I tried on ethical hedonism. I tried on unethical hedonism and couldn't bring myself to do anything unethical. Mm -hmm. I think that there are natural organic things that draw a line. Um, and one of those, you know, between good and bad, good and evil. 
not in a religious sense, in the term that is, be afraid of all that is bad and be afraid of doing bad. No, that's unnecessary. It's just, it's just healthy and right and bountiful and good and your well-being is improved when you focus on doing good, which you notice Christians kind of fail at, which you'll notice uh, everybody kind of fails at. Let's not bicker about which one fails at it more. All the three major religions fail at doing good. Right? Okay, so that is true in the universe. You can um, eat and consume things that grow out of the ground that are healthy for you and very enriching for you, and you can eat and consume things that grow out of the ground or fall out of the sky and are unhealthy for you and that have toxicity for you. And there are things in the middle or in a different category. And I'm not the first to say this. And I'll say, I, I have to say, I, I don't think I was brainwashed by. I think I was very much challenged by. And I had to go off and think about really, really hard and meditate on it when I first encountered um, the, the talks captured on uh, an audio by, oh, Lord, what's his name? He called himself a psychonaut. Um, psycho meaning of the mind, not of the crazy, uh, and not as in Voyager, the way we mean by astronaut, the Voyager that goes out into, into the astral plane, the, the physical space plane. That's what astronaut means. Um, not from, you know, related to Nautilus and voyage and ocean bearing and, and the Nautilus is a sea animal and all that. Um, the, the word implies voyaging. Um, he called himself a psychonaut. Can't remember his name. You probably know who I'm talking about. Curly hair reminds, you know, I hope to, I aspire to be a bit like him someday. I hope. I think that cannabis is one of a trifecta of natural, organic, growing plants. And I'm crazy enough to believe outside of this framework that I'm building for you right now, before this, that plants have consciousness, because everything has consciousness, um, that are divine gifts, but these ones beyond, like lettuce has some amount of consciousness. Impossibly small, impossible to measure, but it's there. Uh, mind you, interesting fun fact. You can look this up. I'm pretty sure it's certain it's true. Human genome, cabbage genome, over like 40% identical, I think. Dare I say maybe 45? I used to say 75%, but I think I got smacked in the face and it was smaller. Uh, long time ago. Something I remember I ran across back in the, in the late 90s, early aughts. Uh, so isn't that curious? All genomics are interrelated. All life is interrelated. Um, there is a divine thing in the cosmos, and some of the evidence is rendered by meditating. Some of the evidence is rendered by um, random phenomena in life that can only occur through life events happening to you in a certain way. Uh, and I boldly propose, and the, the whole like thematic objective of this podcast in conjunction with the meditation in particular, is to suggest to you that cannabis is not a gateway drug to other hardcore drugs. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Alcohol is a gateway drug to other drugs. Cigarettes can, in a way, be a gateway drug to other drugs. They are far more addictive, far more damaging, far more clinically proven to kill you. And I'm still struggling to quit cigarettes. Full, ex full um, disclosure, right? Uh, I, I feel pretty confident, and I don't want to pat myself on the back. We can always fall off the wagon. I feel pretty confident that I'm not addicted to alcohol. But it is crazy addictive. And it's toxic. It will kill you. Number of people that have died from smoking pot in all of known medical history, zero. Don't believe me? Think that's propaganda? Go, to a, go ask a doctor. A real doctor. One that isn't owned by Big Pharma. Um, I know that it's mainstream, otherwise known as lamestream, totally discredited media. But I really, I don't think that that conspiracy theory about the news goes as full and as far as the, the most hardcore believers of it do. I think it's a kind of clusterfuck of fail of good people and, and corrupted people all trying to keep the institutions going together. So there are times when I think real news happens on the news and it's really good for the world. And I think... It shouldn't be thrown out with the bathwater. Um, 
And an example of that is Sanjay Gupta, I believe, right? Sanjay Gupta MD had a show, and he came out of the closet about his 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 coming to terms that he had been blindsided by propaganda about cannabis. He does an eloquent job. I think you can Netflix it. I think you can YouTube it. Go. I'm not here to preach to the choir, and I'm not here to, to argue with, with haters. I'm here to tell you an even deeper level, right? Cannabis is not only good for you medicinally in the ways that are already sort of commonly getting accepted. It is. Uh, and I want to make a distinction here. I'm not silly and I'm not an idiot. Smoking cannabis by itself without clear intent beyond that. Smoking cannabis as if it were drinking alcohol. Smoking cannabis to party is not the healthiest use of cannabis. And it will render not the healthiest results. Smoking cannabis before your body's old enough and ready is also on the unhealthy list. There's always an unhealthy way to do even a good thing. For example, making a baby generally considered a good thing. There's an unhealthy and abusive, and there are many, many unhealthy and abusive, disgusting ways to do that. Right? No need to go into that any further. Correct? Okay. So we can agree on that, no matter what political spectrum anyone listening comes from. Uh, and I'm here to assure you from personal experience, from a lot of um, uh, secondhand experience, people whose experience I believe and trust, cannabis can be at, at the most neutral level be just something better than smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol that would be great for the economy to replace smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol completely. Because um, you can drink cannabis as a, as a whole plant juice, and you can drink it. Here's a fun fact about cannabis. If you eat the plant, it's extra nutritious for you, and it does not have the psychotropic effects. And I'm not making that up. I, I can validate that with personal experience. Full disclosure, I was, oh, and, I, and obviously I'm scatterbrained to begin with, and I do smoke pot. And for this episode, I'm smoking pot on the record. I don't think I'm in violation of any law because while, yes, I uh, will own up to you, uh, uh, I'm a person uh, on, the, on the home stretch of finishing out a DUI thing, I've had my medical cannabis thing for uh, long enough that it was respected by the court and respected by my um, my uh, 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 DUI program case manager that I was told I did not need to let it go and I was allowed to responsibly consume pot for my medical reasons at the you know when I was normally smoking pot which was when I meditate um, in the evening to help me sleep uh, and when I'm being creative to, to help boost my creativity and uh, help me tune in to my inspiration channels, right? And that, those are genuine effects that, that literally happen, can happen, if that's what you choose to intend with it. Uh, so having said all that and given that legal disclaimer, here's to, to, to knock on wood, God bless it, God, God will it, I don't get busted somehow for some reason, because I'm not selling anything, you know, and I don't, you know, I have my medical, it's it's current, I have my driver's license is current, I do not smoke and then drive, I do not smoke while I'm driving. Uh, the only time I ever have cannabis in my car is when I'm bringing it home from the dispensary. Um, as a medicinal card holder, I do occasionally grow my own cannabis plants. And, uh, and here's what interesting, fascinating news, folks, as I, I got 15 minutes left. Um, when you eat it, it genuinely does not cause the sort of mind effects that we commonly call getting high. You don't. It doesn't. Now, don't, don't confuse what I'm saying for eating edibles. Edibles are cooked and baked and produced in the correct way to activate the THC. I'm talking about growing a plant, trimming it down, and eating it like you would eat lettuce or carrot sticks. Uh, and it does not, but it does make you feel like you just had the healthiest fucking food cleanse you've had in your life. And you can do the same thing with, um, with whole plant juicing. So the trick is heat. Heat activates the THC and its auxiliary um, 
you know, chemical prop, you know, chemicals to like align up. So do a quick adjustment. That's why we burn it to smoke it. Okay. So if you smoke it to party, you're not going to render the kind of effects that you might render if you smoke it and meditate. And if you uh, smoke it to, um, you know, intent values a lot. So think about this: you can you can hold juice it to eat it, and your intent is to, to receive the healing nutrition. And there's a lot of evidence that it's healing and nutritious. And like I said earlier, smoking it is the least effective way in order to receive that nutrition in in terms of specific categories of curative um, practices for specific ailments. Smoking is really great for like anxiety, for, for uh, generalized pain, uh, for sleep, and uh, for an overall sort of general sense of, of improved wellness, because I do think that it, it operates at that level. Um, I strongly encourage you, uh, if you are a person who has dabbled with it or is a card holder to investigate not beyond just like uh, the smoking it or dabbing it or um, using oils. Um, there's also, like I said, many benefits to, to eating it and drinking it. And I'm running out of time, but I, I just wanted to introduce those fundamentals, folks. Um, so meditate with it, comply with the law, as someone who was really, really curious about Prop 64 and the previous prop that did not pass, and some of the other ones from out of state, although a little bit less so, I'll be honest, because since they wouldn't be affecting my life directly, I didn't really read them as hardcore. But I, uh, I really read Prop 64 real deep. I went to one of the community collaboration meetings here nearby. Uh, I, met, I met one of the authors of the proposition, not the final bill, but the proposition. And one of the, the you know like logistical key supporters of the proposition, um, whose name's totally currently escaped me, because yes, you guys, especially moments after smoking, within the first you know 20, 30 minutes of smoking, your short term memory and your sort of word file, like I know what I'm talking about, but I can't quite remember the name of that object, tends to be a little bit more likely to 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 you know drop things out. But um, long term studies show that it doesn't prevent you from learning new shit. That in fact it's really conducive to learning, to that uh, state dependent learning, um, like especially learning, think creative tasks with your hand, not ta not not for studying like historical facts and doing math, and, and let's just be frank, you have to be clear about when you do and do not use it. Uh, uh, that was an accident, um, although I do think it's a good point. Clarity of purpose, and it's not about getting the most high. I'll tell you a real truth about that. You know how they, in alcohol culture they talk about um, building a resistance? Pure fantasy. I know this from someone who, who discovered that he could drink a lot. Back in the day, before I you know, even considered smoking pot, I fell for the typical lure of, of drinking alcohol. And I'll tell you about the, the idea of, uh, of building a resistance. It's not so much a lie as that it's a twisting of the truth. The first few times you drink, if you drink too much, you get sick right away. But then your body gets used to it, and then the addictive qualities kick in, and you want to drink. And you discover your, your sort of innate, I'm building a habit level. And there's room to be able to drink more. But you always sort of hit a wall. Every alcoholic I've ever known, I've ever heard speak, I've ever talked with, I've ever drank with, and I've ever been, knows that there's a wall. And at some point, you either puke or pass out or black out. Okay? The worst thing that happens to you when you smoke pot, if you smoke it too fast or too much a little bit, is that you fall asleep. I have seen one person puke. So I know that it makes the distinction fuzzier. Um, but as, as someone that's, let's put it this way. Some people start smoking pot when they're 10. I don't think it's cool. I didn't do that. Some people start drinking when they're 10. I don't think it's cool. I did not do that. So follow the law. And be smart, be wise. I started drinking when I was like in my late, like really drinking when I was in my late 20s. I didn't even start when I was 21. It was later in my 20s when I really was like, I'm going to self-identify as a drinker. Uh, and that's that had been the longer of the two relationships. But I started smoking pot right in the middle of between when I started, you know, between then and now, when I started smoking alcohol now. 
So it's about half as long a relationship with alcohol. Um, and as a transcendentalist, which I've been my whole life, I've there's a lot of teachings that I've struggled with, and I'll tell you what, abdication of all things applies to all things. So I know that cannabis is something to let go of also. And that gets into a di deeper discussion that will have to be saved for a different episode of a different segment. But um, between the two things, it's not like a vote between the lesser two evils. I think that alcohol patently, categorically, undeniably lives deep down the rabbit hole of ego traps spiraling down uh, into the you know ever-rendering spiral of just getting worse and worse. Uh, and that it causes death. Cannabis, I posit to you, lives on the uh, on on the the genuine, you know, universal opposite of the path of ascension, the path of healing the path of good things that ultimately you learn you let go of everything. Let me tell you some deep, crazy sounding shit. But ancient mystics say eventually, if you are if you are a deep spiritual practitioner, not a religious follower or a religious believer, but a, a practitioner, that's a doer of spiritual things, my friends, you will ultimately give up and abdicate eating food in a slow, prolonged process. There's one guy on the internet that claims to have achieved that, that I've heard of, that I've seen a documentary video on Netflix about, actually. Um, who, wow, I don't know if it's a scam or not, but it sounds legit, and he looks like he does it. And they, they the one guy, I specifically call him out because they did a full-on, like, impossibly long test. Like, they put him in a chamber in a scientific study lab where no one snuck him in food. He didn't have food. There was no way he got food. He had water and, and all the, like, you know, objects that he could not eat that he wanted. I think he was able to write. Like he podcasted or video blogged while he was there, which I'm not clear on. And if he did, if that's so, then I want to watch those fucking podcasts. I just don't remember what his name was. And he meditated. And he did not eat. And he drank very little water. So there's something to it. Is that an elaborate hoax? I don't know. It seemed to me from what I saw and what I read and other things that I've read that, con that, that confirm, you know, from other sources, uh, you know, that that's, that's a long-standing historical claim of meditators. Uh, that's easily dismissed as, you know, old-school, hippie, new-age nonsense, right? But I think there's something there to it. And let me tell you, uh, the Zeppo Challenge is scalable for a reason because the practice has to be scalable because your life is scalable. Okay, so one should never beat oneself up about not meditating hard enough. One should always question the way one relates to substances, even positive ones like this, because you can use a, a negative, you can use a positive thing in a bad way. And I've even heard of people using a negative thing in a positive way, which is really hard, but apparently doable. Um, why do I think that's true? Because my meditation, both with and without cannabis, and my research, both with and without cannabis, in terms of the literature that I've read and historical things that I've read and claims that I've read from other people who've done other research for themselves, is that the light and the dark, the good and the bad, they're not in a war with each other to annihilate each other. They're, joined, they're, they're conjoined twins. They are uh, mutually arising phenomena. And that's something that I came to understand intellectually as a very young person, long before I discovered cannabis. Um, but that after having lived my life for a while and walked the earth and, you know, I, I've tried on every hat and I've tried to be an atheist. I've tried to ignore it all and just work and pay bills and not think about it and just do stuff, just play video games. And, you know, I've done it all. I've been a consumerist and just worried about money and worried about buying stuff and worried about meeting girls, you know, and I've come full circle. Uh, and I returned to meditation and I returned to slightly healthier eating. It's, that one's a struggle. That one I've laid, rest, uh, laid to last. Because I knew that I, over my time, I, despite my philosophical alliances with everything that I've talked about, I had let smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol become something that were dangerously close to slipping beyond my ability to say they're a luxury item that I use with clear intent and that are not outside of my control. Because I think that while, yes, alcohol is toxic, 
It is also not impossible to drink it, to celebrate life, uh, and drink responsibly and not endanger oneself. But it's fucking hard. It's much cannabis is much easier because alcohol's relationship with you is going to be of seducing you down the dark path of ego trap and more alcohol and addiction. And as a, and as someone who has smoked pot for half as long as he's drunk alcohol, which is still a really long time, and I started like I said, I obviously had a drink on my twenty first birthday and I puked my brains out. Who didn't? Who did? Raise your hands. Huh? Right. And uh, as 420 rolls around, if you don't smoke pot, that's fine. I'm not asking you to. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just letting you – I am I am encouraging non-cannabis supporters or fans or enthusiasts to allow room for it in, under free will and under free speech in a way, I guess. It's my free speech, right? Because there's nothing hateful or dangerous about smoking pot because it does not drive you crazy. Everything that you've ever heard that's crazy, psycho, bad, propaganda – can all be traced back to that one fucking movie uh, called Reefer Madness. Genuinely. All the, all the bullet points coming out of politicians that are against cannabis. Go watch, go watch the original movie, Reefer Madness, which was, and, and know that it was made by a government agency as anti-propaganda, anti-cannabis propaganda, in order to help sway public opinion against it and balance that knowledge with the fact that for centuries centuries before Christ it was a known talked about, written about, cataloged commonly discussed and nothing to be considered dangerous or worried about medicinal herb in cultures around the world so I'm not crazy for suggesting to you that it is healing to smoke it is healing to eat and it is healing to eat because we used to do it all the time in fact, here's where my theory gets really radical I got exactly two minutes to wrap it up I don't know if I'm the first person to coin the state to make the statement, but I've been saying I've been postulating this for a long time because it just makes sense in my head, especially because it fits right in as part of the the all the other puzzle pieces that I call the the Illuminati New World Order Tower of Babel Enlightenment conspiracy theory. The fact that our bodies have an endocannabinoid system as one of the natural body parts in our bodies that manufactures in our bodies CBD and THC in extremely low levels, um, but that often peak during daydreaming, during puberty, and during meditation, which is why we get some sort of lucid dreaming effects and some vivid sensory effects in very low, mild ways. We have what, some, what m might be called altered states of mind without ever having smoked or eaten cannabis, indicates that it's a natural organic thing of the human body that the organism either evolved with or was created by God with. Because it's right there. And it's called the endocannabinoid system. <laughs> Microphone drop. All right? Now, I'm going to advance, put all those pieces together and advance this. I think that in the long ago era, we ate cannabis. We drank cannabis. We smoked cannabis, and now we've come full circle, and we've reinvented, because we probably certainly had it back then, cannabis lube. But uh, Sorry, I had to take it to a slightly sexy place uh, as I wrap it up, because it's out there. Look it up. I don't know how to, where to get it, but people should buy it. Um, get your medicinal card. If you're in California, get your medicinal card. Whatever state you're in, comply with the law. Get involved with the organizations. I'm going to come back with a part two, talk about organizations on the internet that are pro-cannabis and how you can get involved with the movement. And remember, it's about intent and about thoughtful, responsible use. Uh, and that ultimately, it's not toxic for you. It does sometimes make you feel weird, but I'll talk more about the difference between the intoxicating effects of toxic alcohol and the sort of, um, you know, what we used to call in the old days head-changing effects of non-toxic healing cannabis. And if you like what I'm doing, share it. If you have questions, post them or send them to the email. And if you disagree with me and can engage in a civil discussion about it, please also.